Hello everyone, good evening. I'm Dr. Sharul from uh, Malaysia. Uh, welcome um, everybody to the EPLA Young Rheumatology 5th uh, Educational Webinar 2021. So today we'll be discussing on the uh, a focus on the XA interpretation. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer uh, for inviting me to be the moder moderator. And we will have uh, an excellent speaker today. Uh, I would like to, I'm honored and proud to introduce um, the speaker, Dr. Swan Sim Yap. She's um, from Malaysia. She's actually um, our Sifu and guru in the rheumatology fraternity. Uh, Dr. Yap is actually a consultant and rheumatologist at Subang Jaya Medical Center, Malaysia. Her previous appointments include um, Associate Professor and Head of the Rheumatology Unit at the Department of Medicine at University of Malaya, Malaysia. Um, she is the current Vice President and a past President of the Malaysian Osteoporosis Society, a past President of the Malaysian Society of Rheumatology, and was previously a Vice President of the Asia Pacific League Association of Rheumatology APLA as well as Asian Federation of Osteoporosis Societies and Pusatuan SLE Malaysia. So she's currently the chairperson of the working group for the 2022 clinical guidance on the management of osteoporosis. And she was the co-chairperson of the working group in 2012 and 2015. She has actually served um, uh, as expert panel committee in the uh, management of osteoarthritis of the hip and knees as well as the editor and expert panel committee member on the management of gout uh, in 2003 and 2006. And she is also the member of the National Rheumatology Subspecialty Credentialing Committee and the chairperson from 2001 until 2014. She had a vast uh, um, um, experience in research and her main research interest focused on osteoporosis rheumatoid arthritis, as well as SLE. So um, I'll, without further delay, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Yap to give her talk and educate us on the DXA interpretation. Welcome, Dr. Yap. Thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And okay, let me just share screen. And I would like to thank uh, the Apply Young Rheumatologists for uh, inviting me to share uh, on uh, DEXA and osteoporosis, uh, which I'm always very happy to do so. Okay, I think everyone can see my screen now. Right. So what I'm going to do uh, cover this uh, afternoon or morning or evening, well, wherever you are, thank you all for joining in. Uh, it's just a little bit about the technical aspects of measuring BMD so that when you see a scan, you actually know that it's an adequately and well done scan so you, you can interpret it. Then how you interpret the actual DEXA scan itself and a little bit about how you use the DEXA scan in assessing fracture risk because that's what ultimately we want to do. We want to use the DEXA uh, and other information to find out whether our patient is uh, first of all osteoporotic and whether they're at risk of having a fracture. So what is DEXA? DEXA, central DEXA, which is the DEXA that you measure at the spine and the hip, uh, that's the gold standard that uh, people use to measure bone density. It's uh, excellent reproducibility. There's a very low radiation dose. So it's one to five microsieverts. Uh, when you compare to chest X-ray, which is 0 0.1 millisieverts, which is about 100 microsieverts. So you can see that the radiation dose for a DEXA is actually very, very low. And you can see in the picture there that actually the DEXA operator doesn't actually have any lead shielding because it's actually, theoretically, you don't need it because the actual amount of radiation is actually very low. And it's used widely in uh, studies and in pharmaceutical trials. So when you actually uh, have um, a DEXA and you have a patient um, who wants to go for a DEXA, many of you will have good technologies, uh, radiographers that will do this. But for those of you who may be involved in setting up uh, a unit or setting up the DEXA. Uh, these are just some basic things that you would even sometimes, you might even have to train your technologists or your radiographers to uh, be aware of. So the spine uh, your is 
positioned like this. So there is a block and the hips should be flexed about a 90 degree angle and the spine should be straight. So the picture will come out like this. So the, the spine should not be rotated so that you have a, uh, be able to uh, assess the bone density properly and it should be centered. So when you're looking at the spine picture, you just, uh, just have a quick look, make sure that uh, it's straight, make sure the regions are identified and make sure that there's no marked abnormalities in the spine. If there is, get an X-ray. Now, this is the important bit. When you actually see all these numbers for the spine, uh, look at the individual uh, vertebral BMD pattern. Just look at the pattern. The T-scores should be all within one standard deviation here. So if there's a T, one of the T-scores is very high or very low. There's probably something wrong with that vertebrae. And then when you have abnormal uh, uh, readings within the individual vertebrae, then you would know that your total may not be so accurate. So if possible, you don't report individual T-scores. If uh, you tend, you should report the total lumbar spine. I'll show you some examples later on of what can go wrong. So your T-score, as you all should know, is that the T-score is calculated based on the standard deviations of the patient's BMD above or below the average BMD of a young adult reference population. So this is compared to the ideal peak bone mass at someone about age 30 and 35. And it's used for diagnosis. So we'll come on to that a bit later on. But if it's low, it doesn't necessarily imply that it's osteoporosis. Do remember there are other non-osteoporotic causes of low BMD, such as osteomalacia or even osteogenesis imperfecta, a genetic problem, renal bone disease, malignancy, etc. The other reading that you will get is something called the Z-score. Now, the Z-score is actually compared against uh, the BMD, average BMD of the age-matched reference population. So this is more compared to someone of your own age. Uh, Z-scores should not be used alone for osteoporosis diagnosis. And there's no evidence to support the use of a specific Z-score cut point to determine whether secondary cause of osteoporosis is present or you need to evaluate. Um, there's like, usually people say if your Z-score is very low compared to your T-score, you should evaluate someone for secondary causes for osteoporosis. But certainly uh, it's possible, but you should also use your clinical judgment. And there's no cutoff point uh, from studies that have um, consistently showed what level you would worry about. So use your clinical judgment. In uh, the individual, in individual vertebrae, uh, you should not use individual vertebrae and the use of the vertebrae with the lowest BMD uh, to report is actually misleading. Um, so try and use at least an average of two, if not the total uh, uh, lumbar spine value, and if this is not possible, uh, look at the hip. Be aware that uh, when you look at the spine um, and you look at how the lines are positioned, be aware that if you are going to repeat the bone density, it needs to be reproducible. So if, you have scolio if someone has scoliosis and the spine is bent uh, and people have to adjust the boxes because these lines should go through your intervertebral disc, uh, it will be maybe difficult to reproduce it uh, if you change it because the next time someone does it, they need to be as accurate as possible and keep to the same kind of um, uh, lines so that you, you can have a direct comparison. So do just be aware that some, sometimes the, spine, the results may not be so accurate because it's not exactly reproducible. Sometimes you will get a result for a lateral spine. Now the lateral spine, it measures the cancellous bone um, and it's said to, be, to eliminate like uh, things like uh, osteophytes and aortic calcification, etc. cetera. Um, but because of the way uh, you do the, the scan, um, you don't really have many vertebrae to look at, usually about L3 and L2. It does reduce the impact of artifacts like degenerative changes and aortic calcification. Um, but it tends to give you a lower score. And generally speaking, most people would say, do not use the lateral spine to make a diagnosis of osteoporosis because it tends to be lower than the total lumbar spine. If we come on to the hip, the hip, uh, it's actually a little bit more tricky to position people correctly. Um, the hip needs to be rotated internally between 20 to 25 degrees to get an accurate picture. Uh, so most uh, BMD machines will have a little, uh, like a little 
triangle thing where you can strap the patient's feet in so that they're internally rotated. And when you look at the hip, uh, you will see some boxes and some squares. So depending on which bone density machine you have, the boxes and squares are placed in different areas. So you just need to have a quick check to make sure that it's correct, uh, correctly placed, because most of the time this will be placed by the computer. Your technologist, radiographer should adjust it correctly, but just in case they don't or they're not experienced, just have a quick look. And if you have a lunar scan, this box should be placed at the narrowest part of the femoral neck, and it shouldn't go over and hit anywhere uh, else. It should be just there. For the hologic, it's anchored at the base of the greater trochanter, but again, make sure that it doesn't hit into the greater trochanter or it doesn't uh, accidentally move and it's, uh, you get bits of the box in other parts of the bone. So this is just to make sure that you are at the correct spot so that you have a correct measurement. So the scan ideally should, uh, I mean, should actually include the acetabulum and include a bit of the shaft and make sure it's straight and make sure the lesser trochanter is not uh, very large so that you have, uh, it's not over internally rotated. Now, the importance of this is that when you over rotate or, I mean, over internally rotate or uh, externally rotate, the bone density of your hip does change. So this is only one particular study. Say, depending on the angle of rotation compared to the 20 to 25 degrees that you should be at internally rotated, if you're either uh, anywhere not within the correct rotation, you can see that you actually change the bone density uh, readings by sometimes quite a lot, even up to 9%. And you can also change the trochanteric uh, reading, even though it doesn't seem, you know, it will not be so affected, but it will not be accurate. So the, for the hip, certainly uh, it's a little bit more tricky and not quite so accurate, but ideally people, you should have a look at it and make sure that it's as far as you can tell, it's not over rotated internally or externally. Once you have add, then you have various uh, regions in, in the hip. So the basic uh, thought here is that the Watts triangle is unreliable. It's that little thing in the middle, it's a calculated measure so you don't use that to determine whether someone has osteoporosis or not. You can use the femoral neck, uh, trochanter, or the total. Most people either use the femoral neck or total. The last one is the forearm. The forearm, you've got various regions, uh, and um, you have to just make sure that, that you know, the, there's no like, osteoarthritis in the wrist. Uh, there's proper positioning. It's much easier, obviously, to position the forearm, but it still has to be flat on, on, the, on the table. Make sure there are no artifacts. And usually, uh, you use the one-third radius site for diagnosis. Many of the bone densities will default to, to total wrist, and you may just need to look at the numbers just to get this. Uh, it's recommended that you use the one-third radius, which is away from the joint so that you don't get any uh, OA kind of extra things. Uh, it's right in the middle of the shaft so that you can have an idea what the bone density is in the shaft of the radius. So finally, the last, just the last thing is that what, uh, where, who, which database you actually compare your readings to. Um, in the ICD and IOF, which are our, the major osteoporotic bodies, they actually suggest that you use a Caucasian normative database to compare and get your T-score. Um, but you can see that for most scanning in our region, uh, certainly in Asia, we actually probably use, we use the Japanese reference data or the Asian um, database. This should be pre-programmed. Uh, the only time that you might want to change this is if you get a, you know, an expat or someone you know, who's not local who comes and sees you, then when you do measure the BMD, make sure this, is at, uh, this database is changed so that you have uh, accurate comparison. Now, why is this important? Because basically Caucasians, as you would imagine, have bigger bones. So if you are comparing an Asian population against a Caucasian population, uh, then you would automatically end up with more osteoporosis because you're comparing thin bones against thick bones. Um, this is, uh, something that we kind of have struggled a little bit with, 
Uh, and when we actually measured it out, we, we actually saw that there was a significant difference compared if we use the Asian database compared to Caucasian database. So this is just a group of uh, healthy, post mostly postmenopausal women and men over the age of 45. Uh, and we just measured their BMD for another study. And you can see that Chinese uh, population in, in Malaysia certainly and uh, parts of Asia, uh, there was a higher incidence of patients with osteoporosis. Uh, compared to Malays and Indians, about 22% in this uh, more senior population. But when we looked at them and compared them against a Caucasian database, you can see that a lot of them, much more, much more, even a third more, uh, had osteoporosis. So this would lead to overtreatment. So it's important to look at the uh, scan and just make sure that you're comparing it against a, a comparable population in your particular country. So that was the basics. So what, uh, how would you read a DEXA scan and what are the mistakes and what are the things that you should look for? First of all, I mean, we would know that the, basically the DEXA uh, scan is measuring straight through your body. So the source is here. It goes through your body, through your, obviously your spine or your bone, and it's detected up here. So anything that blocks it in between will get in the way and you can get an artifact. So for example, these are just some things that can go wrong. I don't, I don't have enough time to do polling here. So just think in your brain. Let's look at A. What do you think is wrong? Well, in A, nothing very much except that it seems to be towards one side. So it's not really ideally positioned. It may not make much difference, but you should try and get this right in the middle. So it's a positioning problem. What about B? Okay, this really looks wrong, right? Because basically what you're doing, you're trying to measure your lumbar spine. So your lumbar spine starts at L1 and your ribs end at T12. So this has been just purposely put on uh, where it's just over the thoracic spine rather than the lumbar spine. C, there's obviously something there. Okay, so this is actually a bit of metal. So obviously this would make the reading of this particular L4 a lot higher. D, Number one, yes, it's a crooked spine. It's a little bit of scoliosis. And these uh, white, extra white bits are just degenerative changes. So again, this will increase, falsely elevate your bone density. Finally, E. E doesn't look quite right, right? So what's this funny thing here? So it looks as if some bone has been taken out here. So this patient has had a laminectomy. So again, anything abnormal in the spine would again affect the bone density. Okay, what else, what's wrong here? Oh, well, they circled it nicely. So you've got little bits of calcification here. All right, and these are actually calcium tablets. So uh, they, this particular study did a DEXA um, before 15 minutes and 30 minutes after eating calcium. And uh, they found that 47% of them had visualization of their calcium tablets, uh, usually calcium carbonate but not with citrate. And this actually caused bone density changes outside the least significant change in uh, over a third of the subjects, including those on citrate. So even though your calcium citrate doesn't show up, so you know when you look at this and you say, oh, there's something wrong here, you're going to get them to do another scan. But if they took calcium citrate, you won't see it, but it can still affect the bone density. So this is why most of the time, of course, we tell people not to take their calcium supplements for at least three days before the bone density. This is our personal practice. But at least on the day of the scan, they should not have taken their calcium supplement. These are some more calcifications. These are a bit further on. So you would guess gallstones and renal calculi. So again, possibly these may not affect the bone density measurements, but again, um, try and get them to redo the scan. So what's wrong here? Yep, there's an extra little bit of metal there. And you can see that uh, it will increase the bone density. But there are ways that you can actually re uh, take this out uh, so that you erase it. And then you can actually get a uh, bone density without the um, artifact. So some of the more uh, rheumatological conditions. What happens in enclosing spondylitis? Well, you would know that you get some desmophytes. So of course, that would elevate bone density because there's an extra bone. 
Um, but you also have ligament ossification. So of course, that also may well uh, increase your bone density. You can have scoliosis, which will mean the adjustment and the actual um, putting on the, the lines would make it a little bit more difficult. But despite this, uh, many patients with angst spine can actually be a little bit osteopenic because the spine is stiff. Although you have more uh, falsely elevated bone density, you may well have osteopenia because you don't move the spine so much. So they are an increased uh, fracture risk, especially vertebral fracture. So for patients with angst spine, certainly you may well want to just measure the hip bone density because it's less affected uh, to use that to assess whether they are truly osteoporotic or not. The other uh, condition we have is a uh, dish, and dish certainly uh, you would expect because of the excess osteophytes and calcification, you actually increase and may overestimate bone density by about 24 to 39% in this particular study. But despite this, it can be associated with uh, increased vertebral fractures because uh, the actual bone density within the, the vertebrae itself could be low um, and not be, because it's the, the actual reading is falsely elevated. What about aortic calcification? Aortic calcification, everyone gets very worried about uh, in that you, we worry that it will increase, falsely elevate the bone density reading, especially at the lumbar spine. Um, in this particular study, it, it doesn't really make that much difference. You can see the aortic calcification score it was not significant uh, in actually uh, affecting the lumbar spine bone density. So what was probably more important was the osteophyte score. So the osteophytes are probably more important in uh, falsely elevating bone density at the lumbar spine rather than the aortic calcification score. So don't worry too much about it. Okay, so this is an 84-year-old. She's had previous falls and long-standing back pain. So I think there's a poll here. Uh, what do you think? Can you interpret this bone density? So can we have a poll? That's the poll, okay. So, is that normal? Uh, I mean, the total uh, score, T-score was four. So is it normal? Is L2 abnormal, L3 abnormal, L4 abnormal? Okay, so let's end the poll. Shall we end the poll here? Okay, so uh, some of you thought that the uh, people had normal uh, bone density, but uh, majority of you, although not more than half, said the L4 reading is abnormal. Okay, so let's stop sharing now. Okay, um, can we move on the slide? Okay, so L4 is abnormal. So if you look at the uh, readings here, remember we're saying that it should be within one standard deviation, uh, each of the vertebrae should be within about one standard deviation. So you can see that for L4, the T-score is like massively increased. So then this must be abnormal. There must be something wrong there with the measurement. So because of that, you actually cannot say that the total uh, L lumbar spine T-score is normal because this one is so abnormal. And it's abnormal because there's metal. Uh, they've had some screws put in there. What about this one? So there's no fall and this is the bone density. Um, so this one, uh, I don't think there's a pole. Just in your head, what's wrong with it? It's definitely wrong. And look at the T-score here. Okay, so there's some very low T-scores. There's some seemingly normal T-scores. And this looks abnormal. So first of all, you've got a scoliosis and some degenerative changes. So it causes it's causing a falsely elevated EMD. So um, that's why your your T-scores here for each individual vertebrae are not quite in the thing that you would expect. 
Um, the other thing is that obviously there's scoliosis, so there's incorrect positioning of the vertebral lines, which of course then makes your bone density measurements uh, even less accurate. Um, so you can see that it's just, they've just put it at equidistance from each other, whereas you can see that possibly the L1 should go across here and here, and then L2, it's so difficult to tell here, but L3, one of the invertebrates is going this way as well. So again, this scan is not interpretable, and you should probably just look at the hip scan for this lady. So this lady, uh, another one, um, she had a fall in the bathroom, and this is a lumbar spine bone density. So let's have a look at it. Do you think we can interpret this at all? Okay, so let's have a look. L1, L2, L3, L4. And they've just done L3 and L4 for the total. But L1 seems to be a little bit better than the others. Okay. So what it is, yes. So this patient would have had a vertebral fracture and a collapsed vertebral fracture caused a falsely elevated uh, bone density. So in, in L1 and possibly L2. So correctly, they took L3 and L4 and they, they uh, reported the total in L3, L4. And of course, as you would expect, she has osteoporosis. Okay, this one should be quite straightforward. Huge, dark, uh, dense object there in L2. So L2 is obviously abnormal and you do need to take it out to actually, uh, then, then based on three vertebrae, you can have a reasonable lumbar spine um, reading of the T-score of minus 3.1. So this lady had a vertebral plasty and there's some cement. Whereas if you left the abnormal L2 in, you would have a wrong uh, estimation that she had normal bone density when in reality, in reality she didn't. Okay, let's get to the hip. So the hip, again, you can have various abnormalities. Uh, this one, again, this is totally wrong. They haven't got the correct, uh, it, no, it's just towards one side. They haven't got acetabulum. So send this back to get another scan. B and C. Well, B and C are probably uh, are rotation problems. So remember, uh, ideally, you shouldn't see too much of the lesser trochanter. This one seems to be a little bit uh, too much and the, the, the trochanter is also not straight. So this is uh, rotated, adapted, and this is abducted where you possibly can't see any of the uh, lesser trochanter at all. D, D doesn't look too bad. At least uh, the actual shaft is straight but perhaps there might be a little bit too much of the trochanter here. So perhaps it's a little bit more rotated than you would like. E, yeah, E looks just abnormal. There's this funny thing here. So this patient has had a procedure where they've had some cement into the hip. So again, this would be an unreliable uh, measurement of the spine, uh, of the hip bone density. This one, straightforward, right? Okay, so this one is wrong because you can see this is just totally put in the wrong area, regardless of whether it's a hologic or lunar scan. And then once you put it in the right area, you get a, a different T-score reading, but at least uh, you know that that's a correct reading. Okay, now the reason why it's important to get the positioning right is because you have things like precision error and the least significant change. Huh? Any measurement is, has a variability. You do blood tests, it's variable. So um, you do need to see when you measure bone density and when you get your technologist or your radiographer to measure, um, they have to be able to be accurate and measure it precisely. So the reproducibility um, should be within a certain uh, limit um, and they should practice ideally until they get it to within these kind of um, precision errors. So when do you do duplicate measurements? Ideally at the lumbar spine, it should be quite accurate. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. So uh, your precision error of variability should be over 1%. The femoral neck, as we've already shown, is a little bit more difficult to do. You might accept up to 3% of variability each time when you do the scan. Um, total hit, uh, the total hit because it includes the trochanter is maybe a little bit more accurate and your forearm should be very accurate because you just you can position your forearm accurately. Now the importance of this is actually because this 
uh, helps you calculate whether someone's bone density has changed uh, significantly. So the least significant change is to determine whether there's been a true interval change in your bone density measurement. And it's actually based on uh, your precision error. So the calculation is 2.8 of your precision error. So if you have someone who actually cannot accurately measure bone density and their precision error is higher than what I showed you in the last slide, then the um, least significant change will be larger for that particular radiographer or technologist. But generally speaking, we would accept that your spine bone density would probably have to change by three or four percent to to really truly know that that's changed. Uh, so if you're measuring bone density, that's why we say you don't repeat your bone density um, in less than a year because you know you're not likely to get an increase in bone density of that much in six months, for example. So usually we say a year. Um, for your femoral neck, the least significant change would be about 4 to 6%. So you, you could go down by 4% in your measurement, but you still don't know whether that's truly a true loss or it's just within the level of actually measurement uh, variability. Forearm is about 2 to 3%. So let's see how does that work out in practice. So this one, we've had a lady um, in 2010, had her bone density, and then started on alendronate. And then five years later, she had her bone density measured. So just look at this. Maybe we look at the total spine and the femoral neck. So from here to here, looks as if it's increased, right? Hmm, okay, not too bad, not too bad. Here also, here to here, looks as if it's increased. Now, how would you calculate the BMD change? So basically, of course, you calculate what it was, the, the new versus minus the old, and then you uh, percentage change it. Okay, so for the lumbar spine in this particular individual, it went up by about 8.5%. So that's a significant change. In the left femoral neck, it went up about 4%. Okay, so that, again, it, it's encouraging. Of course, it's better than going down, um, but it's probably within the limits of the least significant change. So you're not really sure whether it's really gone up or really gone down, but at least, you know, you, you can say that perhaps it's not changed at all. Um, but for the lumbar spine, you would know definitely it has improved because it's beyond uh, more than the least, the least significant change. So that's just a calculation you can do and you probably should, and you would need to do it. Uh, the, the machine will do it for you uh, most of the time, but sometimes if you're, you're looking at certain specific, um, for example, many machines will calculate the total femoral neck uh, bone density to significant change, but you might be interested in the femoral neck changes. So then you may have to calculate it yourself. So when you report, uh, serial DEXA scans, uh, just you be a bit, little bit more general. You can calculate it out and say no measurable di uh, difference or significant increase or decrease. Okay, so now that we've uh, got over that, the bone density, um, how do we all tie that in? Because we want to actually decide based on bone density what the fracture risk is, because that's, that's the point of measuring the bone density. So now you're pretty good. You know what a good bone density uh, uh, measurement should be, what the picture should look like, and um, then we need to use it to interpret for our patient. So why do we measure it? Well, the first thing, of course, is that we measure it so that we have a diagnosis of osteoporosis. The WHO defined osteoporosis uh, as someone having a T-score of less than minus 2.5. Normal bone density is uh, above uh, minus one, and then you have this group of patients, osteopenia, a little bit like pre-osteoporosis. So one of the reasons to measure DEXA is to actually say to a patient, yes, you have osteoporosis, or no, at the moment, you don't have osteoporosis. So for example, so you see someone like this, comes to a bone density scan. So does she have osteoporosis? I think there's a poll question here. So look at each. Uh, so this is your hip. You've got various regions here, your femoral neck. Look at the T-score. Your Watts triangle. Talk enter and total.
Okay. All right. So let's uh, end the poll. And okay. So um, two thirds of you of those who answered uh, said no, she doesn't have osteoporosis, but the third of you actually said yes. So uh, mm, that's a little bit disappointing. Let's go back to the thing. Okay. So osteoporosis is minus 2.5 or less, right? So you can see from here, the only part of the spine, uh, of the hip that has osteoporosis is the Watts triangle. And remember, earlier on I said the Watts triangle is actually not uh, one of the areas that should be used uh, to make a diagnosis of osteoporosis. You should use the femoral neck or the, or the total uh, hip. Uh, so based on this, because it's only the Watts triangle that is low, no, she doesn't have osteoporosis uh, based on the scan. Okay. So this is another uh, scan. Does she have osteoporosis? So this is a 31-year-old lady with SLE on prednisone, five milligrams, no fracture, um, but you do have bone density. So have a look at this. So there's a poll here. Does she have osteoporosis? Look at the femoral neck, shock enter, wards, total. Okay, so I think we can end the poll. Sorry for all those who didn't have time, but uh, you know, to answer. But okay, so here, um, vast majority of you, perhaps over 90% or 89% said yes. Uh, and some of you said no. Well, there's, uh, this is a bit tricky. There's no correct answer here. Obviously, based on the, oops, Based on the T-score, you would see that yes, uh, she's certainly low at the femoral neck <clears throat> and at the total uh, hip, uh, which would of course uh, mean uh, theoretically that she has osteoporosis. But look at her age, she's only 31. Right? So you know that people get to pick bone mass around her age or maybe up to 35. So she's possibly at peak bone mass or maybe not at peak bone mass yet. Uh, so at the younger age, perhaps the T-score is not quite so accurate. You might want to look at the Z-score. So when you look at the Z-score, she's definitely low, right? More than minus two on the Z-score, you would say that it's lower uh, bone density than expected. But when people are younger, we actually say when we're reporting bone density uh, in females prior to the menopause and in males younger than 50, uh, yes, we will use the Z score rather than T score because especially in younger uh, individuals, they haven't reached a peak bone mass or they've just reached a peak bone mass. And of course, this is particularly important in children. However, for the Z score, uh, it's usually recommended that we don't say it's osteoporosis or we can say it's, it's below the expected range for age or if it's above, it's within the expected range for age. So, um, I mean, some, in the old days, some people would just say anything below minus two on the Z score would be osteoporosis as well. Uh, but just be aware, of course, that just because it's uh, below the expected range for age doesn't mean it's osteoporosis. There are other causes for low bone density, especially in a younger individual. <clears throat> um, and again, this just emphasizes that uh, just based on bone density, uh, you cannot just make a diagnosis of osteoporosis just based on the Z-score. Now, the usefulness of all this, of course, is that when you have a bone density measurement, uh, it actually tells you and it gives you a good guide towards uh, your risk of fracture. So epidemiological studies have shown that for every decrease of bone density below your uh, the adjustment or below your uh, T-score or the young normal, there is an increased risk of fracture. So you can see that if you have, uh, as you uh, have a reduction uh, in the one-sided deviation decrease, um, 
even if you at the spine measurement, uh, you still have an increased risk of a hip fracture, but of course an increased relative risk of getting another vertebral fracture. So we measure the femoral neck. If your femoral neck is uh, low, uh, you have an increased risk of having a hip fracture at the femoral neck, but also you have an increased risk of a vertebral fracture. So it works both ways. Obviously, if you have a thin bone in one area, you are likely to have thin bone in another area and thus increased risk of fracture in the other area. However, the T-score is not the be-all and end-all. Uh, there are some things that you have to think about when you're uh, looking at the T-score. <clears throat> the WHO just chose this T-score value of minus 2.5 to define osteoporosis because the, uh, they worked out that such a value does identify approximately 30% of postmenopausal women uh, who will have fractures. So they kind of chose that cutoff uh, based on studies and based, you know, just they just more or less arbitrarily chose it, but it seemed to have worked quite well. But to use it, uh, there are some uh, caveats because it doesn't detect everyone who will fracture. I'll show you some because people do fracture when they're osteopenic. Uh, the T score is actually the threshold, uh, is the fracture risk with the T score is driven at different ages. I'll show you a graph on that. And of course, fracture rates vary from country to country. So you have uh, more fractures in, in, uh, in the West compared to, for example, in Asia. Um, but we're still using the same T score. So again, this is something that, you know, it's difficult to, to um, say for sure that definitely minus 2.5 means that you will fracture. So just look at this. This is the absolute fracture risk uh, based on the T-score based on age as well. So you can see that let's take the T-score of minus 2.5, which will be osteoporosis. If you have a T-score of minus 2.5 at the age of 50, your 10-year fracture risk is not that high. You can see that it's maybe about 5% for getting a, a hip fracture in the next 10 years. Once you are like about 65, you can see that at the same T-score, the 10-year fracture risk increases. So you're about 15%. But once you are 75 years old, if you have a low T-score, you are very high risk. So the older you are, even though at the same T-score, um, you are at higher risk of having a fracture compared to someone who has a low, a low bone density at a younger age. Of course, this, of course, this also might reflect that you're more likely to fall as you're older, so the hip fracture risk increases, etc. But it's not the only thing. So you see a 50-year-old with a low T-score, yes, you should be concerned, but you should be more concerned if you see an 80-year-old with a low T-score. It's just, that's the way it is. <clears throat> and the other thing is, of course, that fractures do occur. And these are just some studies to say that it occurs in patients with osteopenia as well. So this is one study that looked at uh, 600 over women over 10 years. And they found that, yes, 20% of them fractured. But you can see that uh, only a third of them had osteoporosis. The rest of them were either osteopenia or normal. So you, you, these are the people that you still have to pick up who are at risk of fracture that don't have osteoporosis. Another study showing very similar kind of uh, um, data with peripheral bone density, you can see that the number of women with fractures, there are quite a few of them still within this range where they are osteopenic. Um, obviously, if you're osteoporotic, your fracture rate and your number of uh, your fracture rate is higher, but even when you're within the osteopenic range, you do have a significant number of people who do fracture. So how do we get around this? Well, Bone density alone, of course, uh, is a good measure of how, whether your you have a fracture, increased fracture risk if your bone density is low. Clinical risk factors can be also used, but you can see that clinical risk factors alone uh, perhaps is also not very good at determining your fracture risk. So this is for every standard deviation away from your whichever clinical risk factor you're looking at. Um, there is a slight increase in fracture risk uh, but obviously, if you look here, bone density is obviously a more powerful predictor. But if you combine the two, it 
seems to work a little bit better and you have a better idea of the fracture risk. This is especially in a younger patient. In, perhaps in an older patient, it doesn't matter so much because bone density would be more important. So with this in mind, really, uh, you may want to consider that some of your patients, uh, again, you use your bone density, you combine it with uh, clinical risk factors, for example, like in FRAX, where you have um, assessed fracture risk using both clinical, fracture, uh, clinical risk factors and bone density at the femoral neck. So just let's go. Uh, I think this is the last case. This lady. Oh, okay. Is the poll uh, is the poll hiding the, the actual thing? Okay, everyone says yes. Very good. <laughs> so this is a lady uh, who I've been seeing, uh, and she actually came a little bit in a panic because the her sister fractured her hip in, in uh, uh, when she fell. So then she was worried. Okay, so everyone seems to think is yes. Very good, very good. Uh, let's end the poll. So if you just look at the bone density, you would think, well, actually for a 70-year-old, she's not bad, right? Um, she's a uh, femoral neck, bone density, the T-score is only minus 2.3, the total is minus 1.9, she's only osteopenic, she's on a very low dose of steroid twice a week, nothing very much. Okay, uh, but of course, she's worried because her elder sister did fracture her right hip. So most of you correctly think that she's osteoporotic and she's at risk of fracture. Actually, strictly speaking, she's not osteoporotic, but uh, she's at risk of fracture. But how would you convey the magnitude of the risk of fracture? You would, I do, um, oops. You would then try and do something like a FRAX. So uh, because it will combine her bone density together with some of the risk factors, RA is a risk factor, steroid is a risk factor, uh, a family history of a fracture is a risk factor. And you will find that, for example, in this, this is a FRAX score, the risk of a hip fracture in the next 10 years is 12% and a major osteoporotic fracture is 28%. These are very high numbers. Uh, usually most people recommend treatment if the hip fracture risk is 3% and major osteoporotic risk is 20%. So yes, she's definitely at risk, but you may not be able to tell this just looking at the bone density, um, but combining it with risk factors, you can actually quantify the risk and then tell the patient, yes, you definitely do need some treatment. So let me conclude by saying that uh, uh, th these are the things I hope that you've taken away uh, from this uh, listening uh, this afternoon. Um, ensure that the scan is technically correct before you interpret it. So the image and the line positioning, line positioning especially important for the spine, but also, also for the hip where the boxes are. Uh, make sure that there's an appropriate database for use for comparison and that there are no artifacts present. The next is that you ensure the results are interpretable. Uh, in children and young adults who have not reached bone, peak bone mass, the T-scores will be low or may well be low, and assessing Z-scores may be more appropriate, um, bearing in mind that you know, they're just lower than expected or higher than expected. And do not use wall triangle or lateral spine results. When assessing serial bone densities, uh, be aware of the least significant change. So when you calculate it out, just be a little bit aware. Uh, don't panic too much if uh, you know, it doesn't seem to have changed very much, but at least hasn't dropped. So again, you need to be aware of this least significant change. Um, DEXA and bone density measurements are really only one part of the overall assessment of fracture risk and do think about uh, using other uh, measurements to try and get a better holistic uh, risk uh, of fracture for your patient. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Dr. Yap, for such an enlightening and a very clear um, lecture on the DEXA interpretation. So actually, we have a lot of questions So um, because we have only 10 minutes for the Q&A. So probably we'll go through some of the important uh, questions. So um, some of the questions about the reference range um, for the um, BMD. 
So it was mentioned that um, uh, it is recommended by the ISCD to use the uniform Caucasian and non-race adjusted. Uh, but what is your comment, uh, Dr. Yap? Should be BMD reference should be a racial or country specific rather than a uniform Caucasian? Yeah, I think as a, as a practical measure, um, we should be trying to use, uh, uh, if you have your own country, that's great, but I think we should be using Asian, uh, Asian references, yeah. Um, for research, I think we'll have to follow and use the Caucasian uh, database if we're doing research and trying to publish a paper. I think for our patients, we would probably need to use the Asian uh, database. Otherwise, we'll over-diagnose people with osteoporosis, and, and then we do know that treatment with osteoporosis, of course, there are potential side effects. So, and then the other question is about patients who have uh, ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis. So, how to measure the BMD in this uh, population as they have, you know, syndesmophytes and osteophytes. Yeah, so I think for angspon and even uh, psoriatic where they might have axial involvement, uh, the lumbar spine would not be so accurate. So you okay. would need to uh, do the hip. But I know for angspon patients, some of them have hip involvement as well. So they may not be able to rotate the hip. Then you're kind of stuck. Uh, you might have to do the forearm, but again, the forearm is not terribly... Uh, useful in assessing bone density treatment because not you know the treatments quite often doesn't um, doesn't increase the forearm bone density by a lot, uh, so you're very stuck uh, on that. So in that sense, if they really have hip involvement with the uh, angspon as well as bad spine involvement, you're left with doing the forearm. Okay. Oh, we have a special uh, audience among us, uh, Professor Sheikh Atikul Haq. So he's our uh, the president. So he asked about uh, for BMD, in which part of the neck or femur should we use for estimation of the 10-year risk of fracture by frax in aberrant cases? Uh, part of the hip. Oh, yeah, he meant which uh, part of the hip? The hip, actually, uh, for the frax, they recommend the femoral neck. So um, you just use put in a femoral neck uh, bone density. Neck or femur, okay. Femur, yeah. So, yeah, so because um, um, we don't um, use Watts triangle, right? So what is the purpose of measuring the Watts triangle in BMD measurement? Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it, just, <laughs> it just comes up. Uh, okay. I mean, it's, it's that middle square in the middle of uh, all those little squares. Uh, I'm actually not quite sure why it just comes out, but uh, okay. everyone says don't, don't look at it. And um, the other question is, um, okay, so the questions keep coming in. <laughs> so maybe we can go to the uh, management. So if let's say in a young patients who have a, a low Z score, so how, what is the approach really? How do you, how do you treat, do you use FRAX? Because FRAX is usually it's for over 40, right? So, so what is your approach for young yeah, for patients? Our, for our young patients, especially our lupus, young patients, uh, our RAs, uh, young patients, uh, that can be a bit difficult. So many of them may not have reached peak bone mass. So again, uh, it will be things to try and maximize the peak bone mass. So you make sure that the adequate calcium, adequate vitamin D, uh, measure the vitamin D level, really, really try and get the vitamin D levels up to, uh, up to almost normal if possible. Uh, of course, then all the other things to, you know, uh, try and avoid steroid, these steroid sparing agents, encourage them to exercise, uh, etc. Um, the if they're on steroids, uh, there are guidelines for uh, steroid induced osteoporosis. So in some extreme cases where they've actually fractured, you may well have to consider treatment. So again, counseling, make sure they really are not going to get pregnant because a lot of our osteoporosis drugs, we don't know what happens when they're pregnant. So uh, a bit a bit more difficult on that. Right, so basically in young patients, so there's um, um, the main aim of treatment is to treat the vitamin D, I mean, make sure it is adequate. Mm -hmm. And you would say that if, let's say, they have fractured, then that will be, uh, you know, a consideration to start bisphosphonate. Is that correct, Dr. Yang? Yes. So fracture, you definitely have to treat. Uh, I mean, you definitely have to talk to the patient to consider treatment. If they haven't fractured and their BMD is just low, then it's a lot of lifestyle and encouragement try to minimize all any kind of bone toxic drugs and, and, and that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, maybe I can um, 
there's another question about um, major and minor concordance. So please explain about major and minor concordance. Is that, uh, oh, I mean, is that concordance? Yeah, because some people will have a uh, very low spine bone density, but uh, okay hip bone density or the other way around. Um, so that really is probably a little bit more important when trying to assess uh, risk of fracture, like when you use fracts. So when you're using fracts, uh, you actually put in your hip or your femoral neck uh, bone density. So some patients will have an okay femoral neck bone density, but a very low uh, lumbar spine uh, bone density. So in, that, in those kind of cases, uh, there are tables where you can adjust a little bit uh, for the fact that your lumbar spine bone density is lower. Um, the other thing that you can do when you have a very low lumbar spine bone density, but reasonable hip bone density for fracts, is that you can actually measure the trabecular bone score. This, this is a new um, software that you can put onto your bone density machine uh, that can measure the trabecular bone score, which is a measurement of your lumbar spine kind of bone quality. So the FRAX now you can adjust for trabecular bone score. I and mean, that would be most useful if you, if you have a low spine bone density, but a reasonable hip bone density and you want to get a better FRAX uh, measurement. Okay, so um, do you recommend using bone CT um, to assess osteoporosis? Ah, um, I wouldn't recommend that because the bone CT actually uses a lot of radiation. Um, so given the choice, uh, if you have a DEXA, that would be better because there's almost no radiation. Mm. So it's still bone CT, yeah, so, but bone CT, I mean, sometimes it's useful because you're doing a CT for other reasons uh, and they just pick up a fracture and, you, you know, then at least you picked up a fracture. But to use bone CT to measure bone density, yes, I think it's possible, but I think there's a lot of radiation involved. So unless you really have no access to DEXA uh, and you need, uh, you need a bone density measurement of some sort, then, you know, I would still recommend that you try and get DEXA because otherwise you end up with a lot of radiation for the patient. Okay. Uh, can we, and the other question is about least significant change. So can we calculate the least significant change between different types of DEXA machine? Ah, uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> but the long answer is that if you are very keen, you can go and look up and uh, there are ways to actually adjust uh, your BMD, uh, there are tables that you can adjust for holologic to lunar, to lunar to holologic. Uh, but I think the short answer is no. All right. So, it's, so it, I mean, would you recommend to use the same machine uh, yes, at all yes. times, right? I mean, typically, yeah. you just yeah. recommend to use the same machine. If, but, and also the same machine at the same center because <laughs> you use the same, uh, you know, a holologic in center A and a holologic in center B, it may not still be exactly the same. You know, because sometimes they upgrade the software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, the recommendation is to use the same machine in the same center. There are several questions on again the interpretation of DEXA as well as the treatment for young uh, perimenopause, premenopause women. So, uh, what is your whether the Frax tool can be used and whether bisphosphonate can be given to patient who you think who has not achieved uh, peak bone mass? Would you recommend that? Um, okay, so if someone hasn't achieved peak bone mass, and uh, I guess what the question is asking is that um, if someone has low peak, uh, low bone mass and you want to boost it up the peak bone mass, can you give bisphosphonate? But if they're otherwise quite well, the answer to that is probably no. You, you don't give uh, someone of 30 years old a bisphosphonate to try and boost the peak bone mass if they're otherwise well. Um, I think the answer to that is no. The other part was uh, if you're around perimenopausal, you're not quite menopausal yet, but you're around the perimenopausal and you've got low bone mass or you've got osteoporosis and you've actually had a fracture, even if you're not quite postmenopausal, you can use bisphosphonate in the perimenopausal uh, women or men. So you, uh, that, that is possible. But for the younger, younger patients, that perhaps, you know, maybe even perhaps they're on steroids, but they're not quite reached peak bone mass. Uh, there's really no indication just to give treatment, just to boost 
their bone density up um, with medicine. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Yap, for such uh, 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 an excellent uh, talk as well as the Q&A session. I'm afraid I have to stop the sessions now, but there are a lot of questions in the um, uh, Q&A polls. I mean, if you have time, you can type it later. <laughs> okay. Right, so um, we have to move on to the next session. So I would like to introduce all of you to Dr. Um, sorry, we, we go first to the AYR Blackboard. So if all of you could uh, log in into this um, EPLA website, uh, epla.org, and you go to the AYR and uh, the AYR Blackboard, there are two challenging questions which focused on the DEXA interpretation. So you can try and answer them um, after this session. All right. So we move on to the next session. So I would like to introduce all of you to Dr. Priscilla Wong. She's actually our um, co-chair uh, uh, in the education um, of uh, EPLA Young Rheumatology. She will um, give a bit of briefing on the AYR television. Over to you, Dr. Priscilla. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Thank you very much for joining this very short sessions of ATV. Let me share my screen now. Okay. Uh, can you see my slide? Can you see my slide? Uh, not yet, Dr. Wong. Not yet, okay. How about now? Uh, yes, we can see, but it's not on the slideshow mode. Okay. Is that on the slideshow now? Yes. Can you hear me? Hey, Dr. Wong, you need me to stop again. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Wong, you need to swap the, um, the screen again. Um, Switch between the, the slideshow. Sorry, um, can I, can, is that on the slideshow now? Okay, it's still okay. your PowerPoint. Um, sorry, where to swap the... Maybe I proceed because it's a bit running out of time. Can you see the slideshow now? Can you see the slideshow? Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry for all the uh, all the um, all the all the this kind of running problem. Um, so hello I'm everyone, I'm Priscilla. On behalf of the AYR board, I'm introducing ATV to all of you today. ATV stands for AYR Television. It is kind of like an advertisement time to bring you the latest AYR news and activities we have. Today, we're introducing the AYR Educational Calendar, the AYR Social Media, and AYR Committee's Ambassador Recruitment Program. The AYR Educational Committee is building an educational calendar in EPLA website, which will list all the key international rheumatology conferences and focus meeting in a 12 month calendar. We'll also highlight the annual national conferences in the Asian Pacific regions. So there are a total of five national conferences during October to December this year. They're organized by the Pakistan, South Korea, Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, and Indian Rheumatology Society. Some of them are free for registration. We highly recommend you to join these online conferences and to submit your abstracts. The AWOL Social Media Committee has been promoting different educational events via different social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp since 2019. We have been doing an AWOL member series to highlight outstanding AWOL members on their work and achievement. We are very proud of many of our AWOL members. They are the future stars in rheumatology. International Health Day series is to feature different health issues. We hope to raise the awareness of all these key health issues among all the rheumatologists with an aim to improve patients' care. In September, 
uh, the, um, the social media committee have featured the World Physiotherapy Day, the World Eye Awareness Month, World Alzheimer's Disease, and World Heart Day. We also strive to promote all news and activities under APLA. We provide information of AYR webinar, APLA webinar, APLA Congress, and the latest news of APLA. So you may give your feedbacks and comments in Facebook. APLA Twitter is another uh, important platform we have been connecting with our AYR members. You can find various scientific educational information here. Now we come to the AYR Committee's Ambassador Recruitment Program. This is a new program we are launching today, and we sincerely invite all the AWAL members to join. So what is AWAL Committees? AWAL is a big family with more than 800 members. In the coming year, we are planning to form five different AWAL Committees to work together. The five committees are Education, MNO Ambassador, Publication, Social Media, and Websites. Each committee is led by one to two AYL leaders. The aims of this program are to recruit AYL members to develop AYL activities under the guidance of AYL community leaders and to develop creativity and leadership potential among AYL members. So all AYL members are eligible for it to apply. The leaders of education committees are Tenva from Bangladesh and Mayasuki from Japan. We welcome AYL members who are meticulous and committed to develop education program to join us. And then the MNO Ambassador Committee comprised of the leader and one ambassador from each nation, except for China and Japan. Uh, we'll have two ambassadors since the potential number of AYL members in these two countries is huge. We look uh, for people who are friendly, cheerful, and passionate to join this committee. And Publication Committee is responsible to provide an overview of AYL activities in different publication channels and to provide research for our publications. So the leaders are Zhu Liang from China and Geraldine from the Philippines. We look for people who are keen on reading and writing. The, social uh, the leaders of social media committees are Himatha from Sri Lanka and Latika from India. They have come up with this wonderful AYL digital roadmap blueprint, which is going to be developed in the coming year. They're looking for people who are creative and active in social media. Website committee is a very important committee since majority of the time we communicate through the Apple website. The leader is Baba from Pakistan. People who have experience in website design or audiovisual aids is welcome, but these are not prerequisite. So you may ask, why do I have to become an AY amb uh, committee ambassador? So here are all the committee's leaders. So let's listen what they say. So if you join the publication committee, you can get an editorial opportunity and a reviewing opportunity. And if you join the education committee, you can build an international platform to disseminate knowledge of rheumatology. Then if you join the website committee, you can develop website designing skills. And um, you also great opportunity, you get great opportunity to join a global network and to develop collaborative research for social media and to make a difference in Asia Pacific. How to become an AWAL Committee Ambassador is very simple. So first of all, you have to be an AWAL member. If you have not yet done so, please apply by the Apple website. Then it will just take two minutes to fill up the uh, application form. You visit the Apple website, and then you go to AYL, and you click on AYL Committee Ambassador Recruitment Program Application Form. Or you can simply click here, this QR code, and then you just take two minutes to fill up the application form. So the application period is open from today to from actually from yesterday to the 31st of October, the end of this month. And then you will get the result notified by our um, AYL board by 15th of November. And then our AYL community leaders will connect with you. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you very much to Dr. Yab and Dr. S uh, Sir Sharon. And um, before we end the webinar today, I hope you can take just one minute to fill out the evaluation form, which um, you can help us to improve our future webinar. Thank you very much and have a good day. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you everyone. So I think uh, the yep still um
Oh, okay. Answering someone's yeah, <laughs> yeah, question. Fine, fine. <laughs> oh, dear. That's Such okay. an overwhelming yeah. response from the participants. <laughs> really? Oh, that's good. That's good. I've been receiving. Um, oh, let me stop sharing screen first. Have I stopped sharing now? I think yes. so. Yeah. 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 Uh, actually, when I when I'm listening to your lecture, I keep on receiving lots of WhatsApp message from my colleagues saying this is really really good and <laughs> yeah, it was really good. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, I hope it's not. Um, yeah, it's a bit overrun, but I think uh, uh, Sharon did a very good job, and uh, it's just some hiccup in my in my showing sharing the screen. I will try to improve on that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Yap, for such a, an excellent talk. Yes, no Thank you, Priscilla, for um, yeah. organizing the session and all the committee as well. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yes. Also, AYR for inviting me, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lansi. We catch up. Yeah. Yeah, okay. We'll do. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. 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 Yes, I am. Yeah.